Welcome, everyone, to the Gathering for Gardner special celebration of the discovery of an aperiodic monotile, something that uh, many of us probably thought would, would never happen. I'm, I'm your Zoom host today, uh, uh, Bob Hearn. I'm the Gathering for Gardener program chair. And today we have a number of wonderful speakers lined up. And um, before we jump into that, I just wanna say personally uh, how uh, blown away I am by this result. I, um, it's a problem I've looked at myself, and if you'd asked me, I would have bet money there is no aperiodic monotile, or if there were, that it would be insanely complicated and probably use some, you know, forbidden symmetries or something. Instead, it's simple, and it's on a lattice with simple symmetry, and it's just unbelievable. So it's very exciting times. And um, we've got a lot of uh, incredible people here to tell us about how this happened and um, what the history was. Um, I'm told Roger Penrose has joined us now. And um, Roger, if, if, if you were willing, um, would, would you be willing to kick things off and, and talk a little bit about um, aperiodic tilings? Well, I don't know what I have to say about this. I mean, I've, I've certainly looked at the tiling, um, but I have, I'm pretty busy with some other things, so I haven't had a chance to study it very well. But it is amazing. I completely agree with what you said. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. My background, not to intrude too much here, I learned about aperiodic tilings from Roger Penrose when he was visiting faculty at Rice in the 80s, so that I, I feel very privileged. If you don't have anything more... Uh, particular to say, we can ask uh, Marjorie Seneschal to talk a little bit about aperiodicity and, and tilings. Well, perhaps I just one comment I could make. Yeah. It's about three years ago, I had a, had a go at trying to produce a, <laughs> a non-periodic mono, monotile. And I stopped doing it because of other things which came in and sort of interrupted my activities. I felt that if it was possible to assign uh, matching rules to the thing I was trying to produce, then maybe that would be a monopole, a, a, a monotile. But I never got around to checking that. The likelihood is pretty slim that it would work, but it's, it's worth going back to, and I'll have a look. <laughs> when I get a bit more time, I'll have another look at it. Wonderful. Yeah, and I mean, I wonder if this is sort of like the four-minute mile, where now that we know it's been done. <laughs> yes. um, Interesting, yeah. Trump, yes. <laughs> Marjorie, what can you uh, tell us about your perspective on, on the history of this problem? Well, I I haven't prepared any, to say anything, but what, I, what comes to my mind is, first of all, for thousands of years, the problem, there was a real problem to find what does tile period, even periodically, not worrying about whether it's aperiodic or not, and that goes back to Aristotle in some ways. And uh, then the monotiles that uh, finding monotiles was a big problem and finding monotiles that tile just uh, parallel and trans translation was was solved in the, about what a little over 100 years ago. And so that already was very exciting. And then the idea that there could be some tiles, some shapes that would tile, but not never tile periodically was astounding. And that was proposed by Hao Wang. 1961. And Robert Berger, is he here? Uh, found the first set of such tiles, and there were 20,000 of them in the set. Um, and so these were not the kind of thing you could sit around and play with. You know, I've spent the past week cutting out hats and pu putting them together and having a wonderful time seeing what works, what doesn't. You couldn't do that with, with the uh, Berger's tiles, with Wang tiles, uh, with 20,000 different tiles. But the people worked on, obviously, the problem there was to get the number down. And the number gradually went down and finally to Roger Penrose, who, who had two tiles. And I think everybody felt that's it. We're never going to find one. Uh, and again, as you said earlier, if there was going to be one, it would be so complicated that we wouldn't be able to play with it the way that we can play with this. So this is just an astounding, wonderful discovery. And I think everybody that I've talked to, it's so it's all over the world. People are happy about this. There, nobody, everybody is amazed that it could be found at all, and then it would be turn out to be so simple. But I want to point out that the proof that this is a periodic is not simple. Uh, and what I find so interesting about this is that it 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 stretches in some ways the previous proofs of other of larger sets, 
in new ways and in very interesting ones. And I think that that's also going to be a whole new direction is looking at some of the ideas that have come up in these in this, these two different proofs that the authors give. So, thank you. Yes, yes, I, I agree. Uh, the, the new proofs are are very interesting and, and different. Why don't we um, go straight to the horse's mouth here? And um, Chaim, can you tell us about how this discovery came about? I can't. I can't. I, the answer is sort of in a sense no. So I should be really clear that. Uh, well, I mean, I can. So Dave. I mean, I know what you know to a great extent, at least in the early part, Dave approached Craig and Craig and Dave came up with quite a bit of the structure and then approached me right when I had just started at MoMath. And then within, and then I was, we were fooling around and then we invited Joseph Myers because there were real reasons for involving him. He had this isohedral checking software that um, was going to be very helpful for verifying that this, you know, just that we weren't making the mistake that the thing was periodic. And then, but immediately Joseph, the, the rest of the history is that Joseph did this incredible amount of work and insights in about three weeks, four weeks. So there really wasn't, that's the history. So I got to sort of watch this explosion, but uh, that's pretty much what I did. So um, I, Craig can address the crest it can address the earlier part of course there's a of course there's 30 60 years of history behind all of that i would like to just add though that i didn't i mean i'm i'm astonished at how simple it is like everyone else but somehow i have to take the point of view that i'm not really that astonished that there is an einstein just or that it even was uh or that it was elusive and then finally was found in this sort of nearby terrain the search terrain that just hadn't been um I'm I'm as surprised as anyone that it actually happened. But on the other hand, somehow philosophically, it seemed to me that given the strange high isohedral numbers examples we'd seen and the strange high heish numbers, heish number examples, that we'd just barely scratched the space of exploring for these things. But anyway, bravo, because of course I expected some crazy program to be encoded in, you know, the wiggles or something. Do you want to say a word or two about the proof techniques, or shall we ask? Uh, Craig to describe, say something about that. We can tag team it. I think Craig, you had asked about the history. So I think Craig can yeah. certainly address that okay. more directly, Craig. personally. Craig, why don't you um, chime in with your perspective here? Your yeah, you 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 kind of asked the two of us in the wrong order. So my, Sorry. <laughs> probably better ask me the history and Chaim for, about the proof techniques. Um, yeah, I will. I will preface this with the same sort of philosophical comment because you know, the idea that we should all vote on whether we would have thought an Einstein existed. I, 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 I like. I've always liked this problem a lot. As I was telling my son, I mean, there are lots of open problems in mathematics and computer science, but for most of them, we, I mean, we know how we want them to turn out, right? Like, I know p is not equal to np. I just can't prove it. But for the Einstein problem, I, I, I could have gone either way, and that's one of the things I especially loved about it. Um, and I'm, I'm just glad we've got an answer one way or the other. Uh, as for the history, yeah, I mean, it was really uh, Dave reaching out to me out of the blue uh, after you know us really only being vaguely aware of each other. I mean, he, I went back and looked and he and I had exchanged emails once or twice over the years. He, had, he has lots of history fiddling around with cool patterns made from simple shapes and looking at, he had come up with some great examples with Haitian number four and five just by hand, which is amazing. Um, as the, the, the very start of this, I, I'm still trying to puzzle it out. He emailed me on November 17th to say, oh, I just saw your paper on hash numbers. And have you seen uh, <clears throat> Boyan Basic's uh, paper on the same, uh, with uh, hash number six? So we had a little exchange on that. And then on the 20th, he sent me an email saying, here's a shape. I don't know what to make of it. Can you run your software on it? And so it may very well be that having just learned of my paper, he, he was primed in his mind to contact me when he didn't know what to do with this particular shape. So it's just my good luck. Um, and then, yeah, he and I corresponded by email from there until about the end of the year. I, in, in fact, at one point, I very, <clears throat> very explicitly said, you know, can you please let me have until the end of the year? Because as soon as we call Chaim, like, we're going to have the answer. Um, so he let me play around. I got as far as figuring out more or less the substitution rules that produce the Thailand. And then, uh, yeah, like we, I, I literally emailed Chaim on January 2nd, and then we reached out to Joseph uh, 
about two weeks after that. And then, yeah, as Chaim said, then it was really over. Like Joseph just sort of said, huh, interesting. And then emailed, emailed back basically like an hour later with a proof. I mean, it wasn't quite that fast, but it was something like that. Thank you. All right, if we can go back to Chaim, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, nature of the, the two separate proofs that are in the paper? Yeah, so first, just to address Craig's concern about, you know, the pressure, the time pressure that would have involved contacting me. Well, the main, mis that was just because I suggested contacting Joseph. <laughs> All right, it turned out, anyway, never mind. So the thing is that the uh, the two proofs, so the first proof is uh, very traditional in the sense of being much like uh, Berger's proof and, and Penrose's and many by Amon and many of my own and many, over and over again, we've seen these kind of hierarchical structured proofs and they all more or less go the same way with all kinds of the variations you know where you have the tiles uh i think we're all familiar with the basic strategy where the you show that the tiles in a sense have to form larger copies of themselves and, the, and particularly what that means is that you identify perhaps some special tiles in the tiling or perhaps all of them and then you say that there's some sort of meaningful hierarchy of larger and larger uh super tiles that then com that each combinatorially behave in some inductive step the same as the tiles below. So the tiles form uh, larger copies of themselves, which fit together to form larger copies of ad infinitum. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you get a sub what we call a substitution tiling at the end. It doesn't necessarily, there might be some strange features like the Robinson tiles and others uh, allow these infinite fault lines, which those, ex I mean, if you don't know that, I guess at some point, like in some sense, you either know this already, or I'm just kind of literally waving my hands in the air, but that's that's kind of the idea. So the, the novel, there's there's actually several novel things about the proof here that um, are about the construction that I think are worth highlighting. So first of all, the combinatorial complexity of the proof is hinted at already. I mean, it, it seemed to me that combinatorially complex proofs are uh, a feature of these simple tile sets often. So the Penrose Roms and the kites and darts and so forth are, are, are beautiful, elegant, and simple, but in that sense, of course, don't seem to be generic. The generic case might be that you have just some weird shape that for no, really literally no good reason, and I'm, I mean that in a very technical sense, I mean that, um, that for no good reason that they would do what they do in the sense that the shortest possible proof would be um, you know, perhaps increasingly long. And then one can even talk about this asymptotically using the undecidability of the underlying domino problem. And so, um, in fact, the trilobite and crab, which I found myself, just if I put that in, is, was one of the simplest examples known. And the, the full proof that it's actually correct is, you know, many, many pages of tedious uh, and highly compressed notes. So, uh, so anyway, there's, the complexity is sort of natural, but um, what is, first of all, novel is that it was great enough that we had to use, uh, that Joseph and Craig really used new tools to um, do some of the analysis, in particular, showing that the tiles had to form these clusters and that the clusters behaved as though they were traditional uh, tiles with marking rules, uh, matching rules, like four, these four matching rule tilings. So that... The complex, complexity is not unexpected, but it's a new and predictably would happen thing where we would have these kinds of uh, complicated, barely human checkable proofs. But what is really novel, first of all, though, is that this idea that there's sort of a base, like in the inductive proofs, you have the base case where the tiles form super tiles and then blah, blah, blah. But here we have this sort of sub base case, case negative one, where the tiles somehow these other tiles, these initial tiles, these precursor tiles by some magic, which is, again, for complexity reasons, literally cannot be humanly explained. I can, I mean that in a literal sense, would be natural, um, somehow form these clusters. Okay, that's fine. Then there, just as an, but then there's another kind of thing that's different, which is um, the nature of the substitution itself is just a little bit weird, like, and the first Indicator of that was seeing the golden ratio starting to pop out in the ratio of the tiles, just from tradi very standard traditional arguments calculating. And then like, why is the golden ratio? This has got hexagons and <laughs> whatever. 
it didn't make any sense. And so what that began to, that was actually sort of a first, perhaps pre-hint, a hint that maybe something was happening. And so the ultimately now we understand that the tiles, you know, we saw the movie that Craig has produced. We've seen many movies of the tiles morphing across the space. What's not really clear in the movie, what I think is really worth noting is that the spacing of the tiles, like if you marked the centers of the tiles, and you wish to sort of track those centers, right, moving around. And you might sort of hope that the center, that you might pick some appropriate collection of points and that those are fixed and that maybe the tiles are moving around, right? Well, the nature of the second proof dem demonstrates that no, in fact, the tile, those points would have to wobble a little bit. And they wobble differently. In fact, they wobble in a quasi-periodic manner. I, I expect that it's some sort of Sturmian thing, that, that if you mark the short wobbles versus the long wobbles, it's some sort of Sturmian sequence, undoubtedly related to the square root of two and the square root of three, because why wouldn't it be, you know? Or maybe the golden ratio, because that just seemed to be popping up for no reason, too. And so... Uh, so the point is, is that um, that's really that's really different. This this whole sort of it's not just that these things are flexing that the we're moving through some space of equivalent tilings, but that and but that actually they're flex that the tilings themselves are flexing in this kind of strange um, quasi periodic manner. And um, just one final note, because I think people here might be interested in trying to figure this out, is if that's so. What's the, the, are those bars that we've all observed in the substitution tiling, are those sort of like a linkage perhaps of some kind that's allowing this uh, flexibility? It, it sort of looks like those little chunks are rigidly rotating with these bars. Is that literally the case? Oh, but the last little point I, for, I forgot to make was that this, this jiggle is so fine, and Craig can address this, that I think it's bounded and small, and I think it's uh, basically sub-pixel size. So you it's around there. Is that about right? So I don't think you can actually see it. And I certainly have never been able to visually perceive the existence of this thing. But Craig can address that. I, I, I wouldn't call it sub pixel. I mean, obviously, it depends on how big your pixels are, too. But um, even in the animation that's on YouTube, I think, if I remember correctly, you can see you can see points far from the center wobbling vertices of the tiling. But just barely. I mean, like I could see it if I like hold the tip of a pencil up to the point and watch the point drift away and convince myself that it's not the pencil tip that's drifting away, but it's, it's subtle. Of course, that animation, as you remember, I mean, like that's registered in a kind of arbitrary way by just picking three points that are common between all the tilings and just locking that locking in that rigid transformation. Um, so, you know, as as uh, Joseph would say, I mean, there there's any number of other ways to lock in that animation that would have different amounts of wobble. So I, I'm not sure what the wobble really means in this context. Thank you, Craig, and thank you, Chaim. Um, I wonder now if we might uh, hear a word from Robert Fathauer, who uh, is the author of this wonderful book, Tessellations, that anyone who doesn't have it should go out and get it. But um, unfortunately, he's going to have to produce a second edition because he published it just a little bit too soon. <laughs> Uh, for this development. Robert, are, are you here and available? I don't have a lot to say. Um, I thought it was amazing and cool, of course. And I kind of right away tried to do something eshery with it. It's very hard to modify the edges of these things. Um, a lot of small edges that fit together lots of different ways. But you can add interior details to try to get eshery. Um, it's called a hat by the author. It looked more like a shirt to me. So I I made a shirt, um, put in shirt graphics, and then I made the uh, mirrored tiles hats, uh, which is something like 13% in the infinite tiling, um, and shared that on social media. And then less people think the hats and shirts are different tiles, I replaced the hat tiles with shirts that are flipped over, so the backside of shirts, and also posted that, um, that image online. Uh, so if you saw the shirt version, that's that's what I was going to show. It's on Twitter and other things. And I will, I've got a, you know, been making foam tessellation puzzles for a long time, but I don't do a lot of it anymore. Um, but I am planning to produce um, aperiodic shirts 
uh, using magnetic EVA foam. And um, I will put that, you can pre-order those, I'll put it in the chat here. Yeah, so basically, well, I can show these, you can see that, right? That's a shirt, front side and shirt, back side. And that'll be the actual size of the tiles in the puzzle. And they'll be made from five millimeter thick EVA foam with magnetic backing. And uh, I actually have a, I've got a printout too. Let me just show. This is just, this is just white, but you can see. That's what the shirt tiling shirt version looks like in just black and white, but played around a little bit with with fish and um, birds. Craig has this animation; she can shows how to change the shape of the tile. Um, wasn't real thrilled with what I've got, so I haven't shared any, any of those yet. Um, Yoshi has a nice online app he made where you can draw in detail. So maybe he should go next as as a logical follow on to me, and I'll quit talking. Thank you. Uh, I did want to, since you, uh, I, first of all, I look forward to those, those products and thank you. I did want to say a word about, uh, shirts versus hats. Uh, I think like, like you, I first saw a shirt. Uh, my wife first saw a shirt. So how maybe Craig or Heim can tell us, um, where, who, who called it a hat? <laughs> ah, Craig says it's provably a hat. <laughs> Well, I just want to deny any responsibility, mainly. That's what, I just want to go on. I, all I did was I was, we were pressuring for a name and then, yeah. you know, then somehow the hat came about. And then of course it looks like a shirt and a hat and a turtle and everything else. But uh, it was immediately clearer from the internet reaction that we might've made a poor choice, but I had it is. So. For, for expositional purposes, I think hat is a little bit nicer. Uh, to put in a paper that that's a but that's very much a matter of personal taste uh yeah we were already Dave and I were already talking about the hat uh off and on I I I, I discovered reviewing old emails before Chaim was involved but at some point later in the process I said look you know we're writing this up I'm finding it hard to just keep referring to the polykite or you know the shape in question or whatever can we just call it the hat and I, it became part of the paper from there. Um, I don't know. I the, the the unfortunate thing. I mean, so Tomas in the chat says, "Oh, it should be called Smith's Hat," which is actually I think is that's a great name, and it should be attributed to Dave Smith. Um, but as you may have seen, and as I discovered after I suggested that to him, he said, "No, nah, I'm really more of a bandana guy," which he always wears a bandana. I'm the, you know I'm the one who always wears a hat. Um, but you shouldn't, you absolutely should not call it Craig's hat. That would be inappropriate. So, but you know, pareidolia, right? What do you see? Please draw that. I'm, I'm very excited to see it. Yoshi has found all kinds of great animal shapes. You got the turtle, you got doves, you got birds, you got hats, you got shirts. Great. Thank you. So my understanding is the turtle is actually a separate tile. Um, is that a different point in the space? Yeah. 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 So, um, Yoshi, um, if you are ready, can you say a few words about the uh, the versions that, that you have created? Hi, everyone. Hi. My name is uh, Yoshi Araki. Uh, so I, I want to uh, say very congratulations to Clay and Haim. Yeah, very nice. And I, I'm uh, very happy about that, Andy. So, uh, thank you very much for your uh, introduction, Andy. I want to present my some slide. My name is Yoshi Araki. Uh, please call me Yoshi. And I'm a president of Japan Tessellation Design Association. So you know the Tessellation nearly called tiring, and I'm a mathematician artist and public creator. I have a, a Twitter account. Please follow me later, Andy. You see, uh, I'm wearing the Tessellation sweater, right? So this is a horse and human. So some of you may know my name, Araki. Uh, I'm a, uh, I made a, this kind of 3D fractal back in 2002 or something like that. And the, some of you may know my, my uh, tessellation stuff back in the uh, very or, or, uh, 30 years ago or something like that. So we are doing the uh, 
activity in Japan with the mission spreading the wonder of tessellation to everyone like this and the publication workshop and the exhibition like this and the, at the uh, museum and the uh, science museum or something like that. And the, recently uh, we do some kind of the uh, classroom with uh, the very simplified puzzle to make a bunch of figure utilizing the uh, tiring. And uh, we did a bunch of things, and the, uh, this is uh, more than 10 years ago, the score and the tile. I made a design for the tile. It's, it's a very uh, hexagonal, uh, a periodic tile, but the, it is a uh, disjointed tile, and the, it is very hard to draw this kind of, you know, uh, beetles. Uh, it's difficult, but uh, this time uh, we have a very good shape, and hat tile is very, very interesting, and the, so. I had to uh, take a three approach to understand this hat. One is the substitution rule with fractal metatile. And the, the second is the design puzzle with an animal motif. And the third one is a web app to paint the tile. So the third one is uh, very good for you to draw your own uh, tile. So the first approach is actually the, the faster complicated substitution rule uh, you are right so this is a it, it uses a meta tile so there are three meta tiles h t p h f and the this is the Craig's and the program and the uh, when i look at the, this one uh, i'm uh, very interested in the fractal and oh this is this this can be easily uh, described and visualized with a fractal shape and the if you take a substitution many many times infinite the limit shape could be the fractal meta tile, and the, this is much understandable. Uh, people, how the tile uh, behaves. So, thank you very much for your comment, uh, Craig and uh, Chen, Haim, and the. Uh, this is a very interesting the, the substitution rule, right? And the second approach is uh, is a design puzzle. The, I had uh, this gathering is uh, uh, many people. Uh, is very interested in the puzzle and the games, right? So I want to make this uh, motif to the, some kind of puzzle or game to enjoy or everyone, right? So which animal you imagine from this shape? So I imagine the uh, turtles like, like this and the tessellate. But uh, how to play this tessellation? We know the fact only around 12% uh, of the tile are reflected. So, most of the tile is uh, unreflected, but uh, this tile is uh, uh, reflected, right? So it's like a, some kind of the phase worry. So you can see the uh, phase uh, reflected tile in, in that, right? So this could be the good observation for everyone to look into the this special tile. So, so you may have found easily that uh, two other parts like this, they are same way and reflected, but the other, or all other are unreflected. So this, this could be a good, you know, way to involve everyone, uh, enjoy this puzzle. Third approach of my uh, hot tile is a uh, web app. So I'm currently uh, making a bunch of web app to utilize uh, for everyone to enjoy the tile. And the, as you see, I want to, let you draw by yourself, but uh, it is a little bit hard, you know, the robot and the me, uh, very long ex experience, maybe 20 or 30, uh, we are drawing this kind of uh, uh, motif, but uh, everyone is not not so uh, good, good at, but uh, I want to uh, make, uh, let you draw more casually, so it's a little bit easier to draw, right? I draw a bunch of stuff, so zebra hat, bird, turtle, penguin. And the, I recently uh, emailed with uh, Dave Smith and the, uh, uh, we have a long friends and, the, and the, he said uh, uh, penguin is good or something like that. And the, so this, this is, uh, you know, the beluga, it's a white dolphin or something like that. So it's up to you. So. So if you have a smartphone, uh, you can go to the, uh, di capture the, this QR code and go to the uh, web page like this. Oops. 
So I can paste the chat, the address, okay? So if you click the, uh, this link, you can open the uh, web app. And the, this, this app is called the uh, periodic Tile Maker. And the, you have uh, two slides. One is a shape. You can change the shape like this. You see? From hat to the uh, penguin, right? Right? And you can also rotate very easily. And the, here, penguin. And you, you can put eye here and the, uh, draw the uh, wing like this. So you can save here on the penguin. Then you can upload to the server, okay? And you can get, you can tweet from like, like this, you can go <laughs> something like that, okay? So, so here there's some uh, works from the uh, other person uh, uh, today. Some is from Spain or something from uh, the US or something. I don't know, but uh, uh, there are a bunch of people it's coming. Uh, so please upload your works. So there are some uh, definition of the uh, drawing like this. This is uh, Tato and the bars and the uh, dabs and the uh, t-shirts. This is inspired by, by the robot, right? And uh, uh, thank you. So this is my presentation. And uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Yoshi. We're all going to have to go play with that app now. Um, so that's very cool. And uh, yeah, we all, you know, we're going to have to go. Um, I'm going to 3D print some tiles for my wall. I think all of us, you know, many of us uh, in this sort of circle have long been entranced with Penrose tiles and have thought about various ways to put them on our wall or on our floor or whatever. And um, there's going to be a big new cottage industry here of uh, hat tiles and turtle tiles. And uh, that's wonderful. Um, Heim or Craig, I wonder, can I ask you? Um, there's been, uh, I believe Peter Petto was tweeting about attempting to three color this tiling and having been successful so far, uh, do you have an answer on whether the tiling, Craig is raising his hand. Can you tell us whether this tiling is in fact three colorable? Uh, there was a, I think there's a math overflow thread. I don't have the link to hand where somebody proved that it's not three colorable because like, you know, here are three tiles next to each other and then force, 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 and then dead end. Um, obviously it is four colorable. And in fact, th there is some interesting stuff to be said about the four colorings. In, in particular, it appears, now I haven't proven this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that this holds up. Um, if you look in the paper, there's a place, a figure 2.2, where we say, look, if you, if you join the reflected tiles to their neighbors, you can sort of map the whole thing into a bijection with a hexagonal tile. And this gives you a nice coloring technique. You can three color that hexagonal tiling and then reintroduce a fourth color for all the reflected tiles. So in, in other words, there's no three coloring, but there is a four coloring where all the reflected tiles are one of the colors. So it's kind of, it's nice. Yeah. Ed Pegg has done some nice analysis of like, not coloring, but looking at the kind of uh, little whys of hexagons related to all of the individual hats. That's also looking promising. Yeah, I've seen a number of great images with different um, coloring rules highlighting different aspects. Yep. So that's the thing we're all going to have to struggle with as we as we decide what to put on our walls or floors. Yep. That's right. So um, I wonder yeah. if we could have um, a word from Dora Schottschneider with with her perspective, because she's been a big part of the tiling community for as, as long as there's been a tiling community. I just had a couple of things to say. Uh, the the simplicity of this versus the complexity of the proofs, I think, is is a real contrast. And um, one thing I noticed this the moment I saw the tile, and especially uh, against the background in which it sits, the background of the 
uh, dual to the Archimedean tiling by triangles um, and squares and hexagon, the, the three, four, six, four, uh, excuse me, it's three, four, three, six. Um, those kites are very special. Uh, they only have uh, 120 degree angles and right angles. And that means the exterior angles of the uh, kite, if you travel around its edge, uh, either going clockwise or counterclockwise, you're either going to be turning by a multiple a, a 90 degrees, either clockwise or counterclockwise, or you're going to be turning 120 degrees. Also, the kites themselves can be bisected along the diagonal into one of the most familiar triangles that everyone encounters as soon as they take geometry or trigonometry. It's the one, two, square root of three, 30, 60, 90 triangle. And there's so much familiar here. I mean, there's, and you can, uh, your background is hexagons, but you can break any kite into two triangles, these special 30, 60, 90 triangles, or into eight kites, which are two triangles together, or into four pentagons. The pentagons you get by, um, joining midpoints of opposite sides of hexagons. Um, and so these hats, I'll call it a hat. <laughs> these hats are made up of, of these nice, very simple, very familiar pieces. Uh, each hat has got 16 triangles or it's got eight kites or it's got four pentagons. And, and um, so here you've got triangles, quadrilaterals, the kites, you've got pentagons and you've got hexagons and they're all there. Uh, so to me, it's, it's kind of amazing that these very simple, very familiar pieces are all there as part of this very aperiodic tiling. Uh, the other point I, I wanted to make is, is that I think the emphasis that this whole thing came together because of cooperation between four people, every one of them made a real contribution. And uh, I also find it amazing that the original discovery was made by someone who is not a professional mathematician. Uh, but it took professional mathematicians to take that discovery and prove that it really was this holy grail that has been sought for for so long. Uh, and so there's so many amazing pieces to this story. Uh, you've got this very elementary geometry uh, that underlies the whole thing. And yet this very complex kind of arguments that make it provable and that none of that could have happened, I think, without all those pieces and those people, the four co-authors coming together. So to me, there's, there's just a lot of amazing things about this. And it's not just the discovery itself. Thank you, Doris. That's a great perspective. And, uh, and I completely agree on, uh, on the people coming together for this. Um, Dave Richardson, are, are you here? And do you have anything you would like to, to share with us? I'm here, yep. Um, I also am gonna share my screen. I feel uh, out of place being listed as a speaker because I have no real expertise in this per se. Um, I happen to be on sabbatical this semester. And so uh, when I saw this come across the wire, uh, I decided to sp spend the morning um, designing a 3D printable version of this. And so uh, I'm just here to sort of advertise that and people can download it. So I made a, I made a short link. It's over there on the right hand side. Uh, I'll make this my last slide as well. So you can uh, see that. Um, so here are the here's the first iteration of these uh, printed shapes that I made. Uh, and as those of you who are on social media know, there is a lot of chatter and pictures flying around and so forth. Uh, and Daniel Piker, who I think I saw on this the uh, list of attendees today. Um, he posted this one, which I just really loved. 
Um, and so I thought maybe I could incorporate that into my uh, 3D printed shapes. And so we need the original tile and we need the reflected tile. So that's these guys. And here's my current version. Um, I just traced over the sharp, um, the curves with a Sharpie and uh, a little messily in a few places there, but that's uh, the shape that is 3D printable. Um, so here's the link again, if you would like it. Um, I could also put it in the chat in a, in a moment. Um, so the plain flat one is available to download. Uh, and that one, you just have to print one and you can literally just flip it over to get the reflected tile. Um, the ones with the curves on them, you have to print the, the two different versions. Um, you can't print the same shape. Um, and uh, uh, Craig pointed out to me that the, uh, the ratio of the reflected tiles to the non-reflected tiles uh, is about seven to one. It's um, the golden ratio to the fourth power to one. So when you're printing, you can keep that in mind. Um, so there's the link. I will post that in the chat, or you could probably just look this up. This is on uh, Thingiverse. You could uh, probably just search for it there. Thank you. I should say thank you to the, the authors and congratulations. This has been uh, fun to, uh, to witness and to be a part of it in my small little way here. Great. Thank you, Dave. There was a question that just came up in the chat. Um, somebody mentioned Amon bars. And um, I also saw what I would have called Amon bars in this tiling, uh, these long parallel lines that are spaced by ratios of the golden mean. Um, Chaim or Craig, could you say anything about, about that? Yes, I'd be pleased to turn the floor over to Chaim, who I think would like to, he's, he's asking to. Uh... So, so, I mean, they're there. I mean, there's definitely, I, I mean, I, I did hit the chat real quick. I, I don't know. And I mean, of course, we'll find out and people will explore this. But my feeling is that when you have these substitution type structures, you just get this sort of thing for free, especially along made, you know, that you'd have these axes and you'd sort of see these kinds of um, sequences and bars and all of that stuff just kind of comes along for the ride. I don't know that, and then, but then, but generically, you would expect that this would be a total mess. That those kinds of structures would be hard to decipher and not necessarily humanly appealing. And of course, with the almond bars, we have this very extreme case where it's very simple and beautiful, and we get the regular, you know, the Fibonacci words. Which, of course, it's not that the Fibonacci words that the that the properties that they have are unusual, but what's unusual is that they're a very simple example of that. So I don't expect necessarily a simple example of such a, such a thing, but I, I to me, it feels like very much a hallmark of all of these hierarchical substitution type structures. Now, whether I could be wrong, of course, but. I just wanted to add a small note. So yeah, I also think, I think they're hard, a little bit hard to construct precisely, but I think there, there will turn out to be almond bars here. Um, I, after the, the talk yesterday, I was exchanging a couple of emails with my colleague, Jeff Shallot, who's a, a sequence guy. As he said, he's like, you know, for me, I'm a graphics person, but I, I disavow knowledge of three dimensions. And he's like, he said, no, 2D is too hard. 1D is where it's at. And so he wanted to know what, like, are you going to find Sturmian sequences along along lines in the tiling? I think the answer is definitely yes. In fact, I'll, I'll say something more concrete. I think that you will find actual literal Fibonacci tilings like or Fibonacci words along designated lines. And that almost is kind of a, a through line directly to Amon bars, I think. So like Fibonacci words with golden ratio spacing, uh, I think are in there somewhere. Why don't we move to a uh, Q&A format at this point? Anyone who has a question, um, raise your hand and we can, we can allow you to speak. I'm sure there's a lot people people want to say here. Okay, see, Vladimir already is asking like the hard, the hard, hard questions. Um, uh, I don't know. Like what, what, I mean, the question is, what does David do? And the answer is, I don't know. He, he may possibly be retired. He did the closest, the most information I have is at one point he mentioned that he had a background involving pre-press. And then as far as we know, Joseph, all Joseph has told us is he is a software developer. We do have a hand raised, um, Jessica Real. You feel free to unmute yourself and, and speak. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Thank you um, for this very interesting topic. I just wanted to uh, say to Yoshi, 
uh, that I would I would I liked a lot <laughs> his presentation and uh, I invent strategy games for two players. I invented already many connected with mathematics like fractals for fourth dimension, etc. And so in case you are interested or anyone else is interested in uh, trying to work out uh, two player strategy games on this tessellation uh, would be very interesting for me. So just keep in touch. Uh, you can find myself uh, Cesco Reale in LinkedIn or uh, Facebook or other means. Okay, thank you very much. What is your opinion on whether a uh, a tile, a uh, an Einstein tiling, is possible without any flips? Uh, does anybody have an opinion on that? So this is yeah, this is a question that has come up many times. Um, according to all of the standard definitions of the problem, it's perfectly legal. Um, of course, it's natural to wonder whether there is. Um, yeah, you know, uh, um, any periodic monotile that uh, you can just translate and, and rotate. Um, Chaim wrote a very nice um, response to this. I don't know if Chaim or, or I, wants to say a few yeah, words. So, so we addressed this. I mean, of course, this is a real question and it, and it matters and it's come up again and again, and maybe we should be more direct about it. So, um, but in the end, it's a, it strikes me that one could take it either way, and it's ultimately either it's. But it's not just taste; it's a cultural question. So within the culture of mathematics, it's been long taken that this is the accepted definition of when two shapes are equal. And I've been asking around, and one thing that was pointed out is that the educational system in this country tells children this, but they might be because just that the math we got to them, you know, we got we got the system to agree with us or something. But you know, clearly. Um, some people that are working with actual physical glazed tiles would probably perhaps agree because you need two templates, right? If you have two glazed tiles, it really is different. Um, but but it strikes me that most of our experiences with pieces of paper, you flip them over. Anyway, Craig, sorry. Oh, so somebody, I think by email, suggested to us that the problem of, I mean, the, the non-reflection equivalent of the Einstein problem should be called like Einstein's bathroom problem because you, right. you, you actually need to make the tiles one way up so you can't flip them over the same way. But, but in any case, the, the mathematical problem as it stood for all these years has been where it counts and so we're not going to say no. Yeah. And, and finally, though, I, I, I mean, I think all bets are off, clearly, in terms of the complexity. I think we can all expect that, that we have no idea what is likely. I mean, rather, we can expect that there are great surprises ahead of us, which would mean put money on, yes, there's a Einstein with no reflections. Life would have been pretty nice if you could start from the hat and, like, divide up the tiling into clusters where each cluster contained one reflected hat and the whole thing, you know, you could tile with that without reflections. But it's pretty clear that you're not able to do that because the reflected hats occur in an, in a, in an irrational proportion of all tiles. I would also mention that since the ratio of reflected hats to hats is the fourth uh, power of the golden ratio, that this to me suggests a conceivable connection with Penrose tilings. Uh, that golden ratio uh, popping up like that is, seems very uh, suggestive to me. Yeah, as, as Kai mentioned, this uh, is, is characteristic for um, anything aperiodic that, that you tend to find. But um, well, let me, no, I, don't, I didn't mean that. I mean, I'll yeah. just let that stand, but that's not what I meant. Oh, I'm sorry. Just like the one would have these kinds of things, not such a nice one. That is a pretty big surprise. Golden ratio has a nice algebraic number. Yes. Uh, I see Dwayne Bailey has his hand up. Congratulations to all of you guys. I uh, have been in this field for quite a while, and um, discoveries in this field have implications in not only mathematics, but computer science and art and culture. And uh, I think uh, you, you must uh, stop and just take a deep breath and think about what the impact of this is um, on just even art around the world. I think it's, it's gonna be a beautiful thing. I think uh, we're gonna get a much uh, 
a simpler view of this down the road. I think things, you know, the dust is going to settle and uh, it's going to be, it's be, it's going to be uh, its own beauty in the end. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting about the Penrose tiles is uh, over the years, we've come to see that they are a manifestation of, of um, things that happen in higher dimensions uh, with, with periodicity. And uh, in, in that light, from a mathematical point of view, it just seems kind of uh, beautiful that it is uh, sort of something, a projection from a higher dimension uh, that's just uh, getting encapsulated in this pair of tiles. Here, um, I'm, I'm struggling to see something, um, you, you know, like long range symmetries that are, you know, five or 17 or, 11 or, and, but of course it looks like three or six or, or stuff like that. And I'm wondering um, two questions, whether you think that there's gonna be anything like uh, a relationship, uh, a projective relationship from a higher dimension. That's one, uh, a deep question. Uh, two, uh, whether or not you think this is going to open the door uh, to thinking about, um, uh, monohedral tilings in, in three space uh, or, or higher dimensions, because uh, I, I think once you get to uh, an Einstein in, in, in two dimensions, it really opens up the possibility in all dimensions, right? I, I think either that or no, or never, right? Yeah. Those are two great questions, Dwayne, and I, I had wanted to ask both of those myself, so thank you. Um, Kaim, Craig? I guess... Um... We know for sure that Einsteins exist in sufficiently high dimensions, right? Because uh, the recent result by Greenfeld and Tao shows that they're, I mean, we don't like that is very high indeed. It's not like just a large number. It's more like we don't even know how many dimensions would be needed, but there exists a number of dimensions during which it, within which we can construct a tile that not only is a solution to the Einstein problem, but in fact, only by translation. Never mind uh, rotations or reflections. Uh, I think. I think. But yeah, moving this up to three D now would be extremely interesting. And I, I don't know the answer to that. In fact, they they suggested somewhere, maybe it was online, that they that their techniques or their ideas. Well, I don't see how directly, but anyway, that there that this would suggest that there be a, an aperiodic monotile by just translations and perhaps dimensions, th lower dimensions. Like it's something like two to the two to the hundredth, but I think they meant yeah. as low as four or something. <laughs> but yeah, clearly all bets are off. And I mean, I think for me, this is like just something I've been feeling for decades now that, you know, computational complexity just kicks in immediately. And once that happens and all bets are off. And here we have a vivid demonstration that at least we didn't, you know, <laughs> the space doesn't take much to have something interesting happening. So 3D, it, of course, as far as the higher dimensional cut and project stuff, well, that's clearly for the future, for some future mathematician to to tell us, right? But uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm certainly very curious about that as well because you know Penrose tiles, you know all those aperiodic things that we are used to, we we have been taught to see them as slices of of hyperspace yeah. lattices. Um, I see uh, Pete Winkler has his hand up. Uh, you have a question, Pete? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so uh, Doris mentioned that, of course, these um, um, hats are, are made up of 30, 60, 90 uh, right triangles. Um, but right triangles, which instead are two by one, the so that is the, the legs are, are yeah. length one and two, make very nice recursive tilings that were studied by Charles Radin. Yeah. And so it makes me wonder whether there might be a monotile composed of those instead of the 30s, 60s, 90s? It's a great, it's a great question. I mean, in principle, Joseph or I could carry on a computer search in the space of glued together pinwheel tiles. That'd be pretty neat. I mean, within the pinwheel tilings themselves, it's pretty, I mean, if you meant literally within the pinwheel tiling, I don't think that's likely, but if it's uh, sticking the triangles together. So what, one thing that happens here is very nice is that the lattice on which we're working is much more flexible. So the pinwheel tilings are in a certain sense, very rigid combinatorial objects where you can't really pluck chunks out. I mean, in a hexagonal tilus, it's very plainness might be what's helping us here. 
someone was mentioning that Roger Penrose had his hand raised. I don't see that. Uh, was there something you wanted to add, Roger? No, I, I just was struck by not just the existence of these timings, but the difficulty in proving they're aperiodic. Non well, yes, the, that there is a tiling, in fact. The, <clears throat> I just wondered if there isn't, I'm not sure how to formulate my question, but you have something like uh, in the Goodstein theorem, you have something which can't be proved by the piano arithmetic axioms. You, you have to go beyond it. Now, I wondered whether the tiling here is there's some level of logical complexity which goes beyond the simplest example. I'm not quite sure how to formulate my question. I mean, you, you could, presumably the tiling is computable, but is it, has it a kind of logical level which is beyond um, periodic or even straightforward hierarchical? I, I don't feel that's the case because the uh, we can understand the um, the exact, we can pretty much characterize exactly what tilings are in this space. We don't have it completely explicit, but we do know that, for example, every tile is in a hierarchy of tilings. And certainly the tile is not computationally universal in and of itself. Um, it, yeah, I am struck by the yes. complexity of the, the combinatorics, but that's also sort of starting to show up in other examples as well, and maybe it's natural. I don't know. Of course, we'll see, too. Yeah, it just struck me how how difficult it is to show, e even that it's tiles at all, which, which is quite remarkable. Such a simple tile, you wouldn't think that you have to go to these lengths to show that it tiles the plane. Hmm. So I wondered whether there isn't a sort of logical... I, I'm not... As I say, I don't quite know how to formulate my question, but maybe maybe what you say says it's not the case, but um, I, I just wondered whether there is something... Yeah, I don't know what would... I don't know what would constitute uh, establishing a level of difficulty of how hard it is to tile the plane with this shape. I mean, from mm. a computational point of view, I know that the algorithm for drawing the tiling is like big O of Craig, which is to say I was able to do it. So it can't be that hard. <laughs> and it's, it's only, I mean, if you look at the code, I mean, the code is online. You can make your own patches of tiles. It's something like 700 lines of JavaScript. And a big chunk of that is user interface nonsense. So in fact, the algorithm, and I'm not trying to be clever about how I wrote the code either. So the algorithm to construct the tiling from scratch is, is pretty easy to write down, I think. Okay. Um, and I would say beyond that, and this is not exactly in the paper in great detail, but there's, there's maybe even easier ways to describe the construction of the tiling because we know that there is a, what Chaim has called a uniform substitution tiling, a nice geometric substitution okay. of yes. shapes related to the ones that we use, which you could, you know, that's much easier to iterate as many times as you want. And then okay. from that you get tiles. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, the code, the code, yeah. Um, yes. Greg, can you share a link to... Uh... Yeah, everything you want is at the URL. There's there's a bunch of other stuff there too. Uh, call me. Given the later developments um, in crystallography that grew out of the discovery of the Penrose tiles, I'm wondering what people might anticipate could uh, be the result of the recent discovery in 3D crystallography or otherwise. Why we can't know that? This is for the future. This is for all these young right. people that might be inspired to go out and discover amazing new things. I don't know. I'm just a dumb mathematician. <laughs> just leave me. Reality is a whole nother ballpark. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have asked online, are there implications for quasi crystals? And I mean, my, my simple answer to that is uh, just because the Penrose tilings turned out to have such profound connections to quasi crystals, that's not something we should necessarily expect of aperiodic tilings. And there are plenty that don't, you know, that have a quasi crystal connection. Doug McKenna, you have your hand raised. I'm sure you have an interesting question. So my question is, is, is it computationally hard to search for the equivalent of the Amon lines? I mean, there's only, I mean, you can draw lines on the tiling and somehow maybe discern 
whether they're falling into alignment, so to speak. And I, I don't know, is there a binary search you can do that gets you to a place where you can actually think through the actual geometry of it? You know, can you can you experimentally find something that approximates, you know, one of these uh, almond bars and then determine that it actually works? I worry that I would just and you know it, it, that it would devolve into you know drawing golden spirals over landscape paintings, right? Um, like, yeah, it kind of looks like it lines up, but uh, I don't know. I, I'd much rather try to find a construction that propagates line information through the substitutions. Um, that I'd be more invested in. Robert uh, Alan has always been a mysterious figure to me, so I'd love to. Have anybody met him or talked with him? Doug, you uh, did? Yes, I met him. Wow. Yeah, I met, I met him also. Amazing. He was a strange fellow. I think he was maybe pretty far on the autism spectrum. Uh, anyway, I met him in the very early 80s. He gave a talk in somewhere in Massachusetts. I went to it. Um, you know, and he he had written a bunch of stuff to Martin Gardner and Martin Gardner then forwarded it to Mandelbrot. And Mandelbrot gave me a bunch of Amon's notes. I still have those copies of, of that. And he, you know, he was playing with the square root of the golden ratio and coming up with all sorts of, of tiles and, 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 you know, the, the one by the square root uh, of the golden ratio rectangle mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. But, so that's why I was interested in actually going and hear him give a talk. I don't remember too much about the talk itself, but I went and talked to him afterwards. And he was a, a strange, strange fellow. Um, so anyway, yes, uh, I, I met him. Yes, I'd like to say two things about the Ammon. First of all, the bars, they're very closely related, not directly, but they're to the, to the high dimension, the five dimensional projection. Uh, and it was when I put, I brought Ammon and De Bruyne together to talk about it. It wasn't they, we didn't get very far with the conversation, but they, it was clear at least to De Bruyne and not if not to Ammon that this is really where what the Ammon bars were really about. Uh, he had them spaced differently than than the De Bruyne's uh, picks, plenty, pick, um, whatever um, grids. But nevertheless, it was similar. It was but not the same thing. And the other thing I want to point out, just really interesting, that Ammon, uh, like Smith, was not a mathematician at all, and he had. Uh, he described himself to Martin Gardner as uh, uh, a, I forgot what he said, but just someone with math interest, a hobbyist with math interest. And yet he had these brilliant ideas, which even he didn't even appreciate what he had done, but nevertheless, he he did do them and he shared them with Martin Gardner and that's how they became known. And I remember Martin Gardner sent them to you, Roger, didn't, uh, also to look over and see, with, and you found that he had in fact discovered the Penrose Roms, although they weren't. I think he'd rediscovered, I'm not sure how much of a clue he had. Uh, there was some remark that Martin Gardner made in his column about what he was going to do the next, in the next episode, whatever, in the next volume, whatever you call it. And uh, I, I don't, the clue was pretty, I don't think, he, I, it's very hard to see how Ammon would have found the rhombus a tessellation simply from that clue. I think he 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 almost did it himself. He did it himself, and when he saw that clue, he that's when he wrote to Gardner and said, "Look, I did it too," but he didn't know what you had done. Yeah, uh, I see. So I, see. I too have found some non-periodic tiles, and there they were. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's interesting that two real breakthroughs come from people who are not part of the professional community, but who have played with this and looked at it in their own way and found something. Yeah, no, I agree. That's that is remarkable. Yes. Yeah. It's one of the magical things about this field that's always attracted me is that it is accessible and we can share it and we can, I can tell a child what, about my life's work to some extent, you know, that's fantastic. <laughs> it's the mathematical equivalent of simulated annealing. As I, as I mentioned to Chaim, I was in fact hoping to write a book that was accessible to a general audience about the beautiful mysteries of tiling theory. And I just ruined part of the book, but you know, maybe I won't, I won't not too sip too much sour grapes about that. I think. <laughs> Heard a lot of, a lot of great things from a lot of wonderful people. Um, there are some more links in the chat. You might be interested in Colin has just put in a plug for um, thread discussing this on Mathstodon. 
Um, there's another link to some 2D tilings Anton Baker has just posted. So I'm going to suggest if there's no more um, questions, we, we wrap this up and uh, thank all of our speakers. Thank you very much, Roger Penrose, for joining us. We're all honored. And well, thank uh, you, Philip. Thank you for the opportunity. I mean, it's an amazing time to be around. I'm glad I'm still around. <laughs> <laughs> glad you all are too. We are too. <laughs> and um, thank you, Chaim and, and Craig, uh, as, as co-authors for answering all of our, our questions. And thank you for the perspective from uh, Doris Schachneider, Robert Fathauer, Marjorie Seneschal, Dave Richardson, and uh, Yoshi Araki, and everyone else who has contributed and asked questions. Well, I would just like to say on a personal level that it's been so marvelous. I mean, I'm, again, my role is not really clear in this, but it's been wonderful to have, uh, you know, so many people react to this and really, well, I guess one thing, I've, I mean, I've been involved in this area for 30 years and or more, really 40, I suppose, since I first learned of the Penrose ROMs as a teenager and to sort of see it kind of come to this point, it feels regardless of um, where it comes from. I mean, it's sort of, it feels vindicating to see the in level of interest in this area and the passion which people are approaching the, uh, you know, making this, having fun with this example. It's a terrific area. And, I, and just sort of seeing this rejuvenation of, of uh, attention is fantastic. And of course, just on a personal level, just to, sh to see all of you and to, enjoy we're all friends for this because we all enjoy this stuff you know it's like having a, fa a fabulous new feast together so thank you very much for that and it's been really a privilege thank you it was uh it was always on the list of problems for me it's like i i really hope i get to see the answer to this one but i would never expect to have been involved in that answer and it's seems incredibly lucky to me and uh, I'm grateful that I just got pulled into it out of the blue and uh, got to contribute. I wanted to ask uh, your, your paper, your beautiful paper is up on archive. Um, is that going to go to a journal or what, if you picked a target? It's It's been submitted, yeah. Um, I don't know, I, I don't know. If, is it is it a matter no, no, of no, no, to start discussing for that? the yeah, only the only thing I'll say is uh, uh, Joseph steered us for valid philosophical reasons. He pointed us in the direction of a a diamond open access journal, which I think is a great idea. You know, one that's, yeah. that's owned by its editors. Right. Great. So not one of the marquee. Well, is it? Right. Oh, that, yeah, that changes the landscape a little bit. But yeah, you know, it's not like an El Cebular journal or something like that. Okay. So I had this weird thought just a second ago, which is, a, you know, kind of a personal story, so I'll tell it, but <clears throat> my dad was a geologist and a paleontologist, and when I was about 11 years old, he took me to uh, the Lamont Doherty uh, uh, labs for Columbia University, and uh, showed me the first evidence of continental drift, the, the clinching mm. evidence of continental drift, which was the, uh, the, uh, the magnetic stripes across the North Atlantic, you know, across the Atlantic ridges. And so, you know, that was the clinching, it was like the clinching moment to prove that theory. And uh, so this is sort of a sort of a similar experience, I think. And it's really exciting and uh, it's really cool. And I think there's gonna be some more discoveries in this area because it's now you've, you've shown existence and, uh, and you haven't shown uniqueness, so. <laughs> if someone shows that this is the only one, <laughs> I, I think I'll probably have to resign. I'll quit mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're muted. It's I mean, so exciting having been in this area so long, right? Anticipating all these fantastic new discoveries, right? The, come on, people, let's go see those three D examples and those yeah. projections from and higher dimensions and connections to crystal. Knows? I mean, I mean, by by another measure, Doug, we found uncountably many of them. How much more do you want? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
I have a, a little reluctant. This is a bit of a digression, but uh, since Roger is here, I, I, I'm, I'm just drawing a diagram of a problem that uh, he saw through um, Martin Gardner. It's an unsolved problem that's extremely simple to state. So maybe it's a problem that some of you can work on. It's, it's, it may very well, I suspect it has a computationally a base solution. Can I share my screen is the question. I can David. enable that. Hold on one second. Okay. Because uh, Roger, your reaction to this problem is, is one of the my favorite <laughs> quotes. You can now share your screen. Okay. Um, okay, so the so this is on, well, I guess it's, it's, it is related to cell, uh, sh, uh, filling space, but it's not a uh, tessellation problem. The question is, a cubicle, first of all, a cubicle snake is just a, a sequence, it's a polycube in space that where each cube only contacts two other cubes. <laughs> of course, uh, along a face, it's allowed to self-contact along an edge or a corner. And of course it can have one end. And the question is, can you tile space with two snakes? <laughs> Tile space with two snakes. Wow. The report, uh, Roger's reported answer when uh, Gardner showed him this problem, maybe you remember this was, it's obvious that, and they paused and he said, no, it's not obvious. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like me, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> it's very hard to make. So um, Gardner did publish that it, I had a solution with four snakes, but he didn't show how. So this is the first time I'm showing the solution to anybody. Um, you take two snakes and you make this little cu cuboid. It's one higher than it is wide. And then you surround it and sort of like envelop it with another pair of snakes that start from the center, spiral out, spiral up the side, and then come to a close, except stop one square short of closing it. And that allows the red and the yellow snakes to, to poke through and, and they end up where these white dots are. And then they go out and down. And the amazing thing is that the uh, kinks propagate down at a diagonal and end just at the right place. It's spatial, but it feels like the timing's right. Um, and then they spiral in towards the center and you do the same thing. So you get, you, you cover the whole thing twice and the, and they keep poking through each other. That's so true. that's, that's, that's the, uh, that's the solution for four. Uh, there, of course, there may be others. I have no idea that if there's, I suspect there isn't one for two and that some sort of computational solution looking at local space will, will solve it. Um, and I have no intuition for three. I kind of think not, but it's completely open. <laughs> Roger, do you remember seeing this? No, I've forgotten all about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. was a long time ago. Yes. Gosh, just a snake is a snake. It's got two ends. Has it, or is it allowed to be a loop? Uh, well, it wouldn't fill space at, at that point, but it could oh, be endless. Yes. It's got to fill the uh, whole of space. Is that it? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Scott, does this problem have a name? Uh, I guess it'd be snakes in space, sort of like snakes on a plane, but... Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I'm calling it just the snakes problem, but that's a little too general. That's right. Anyway, cool. uh, I'll stop uh, stop sharing. That's an unsolved problem that I it's got to have a pretty simple solution. <laughs> One thing, however, uh, in exploring it, I said, well, what are the patterns that you can get with just tiling spaces with infinite numbers of black and white ones? And I found that if you do a, a spatial spot uh, helix in space uh, or a, a, a cubicle helix 
that goes n cubes in x, n cubes in y, n cubes in z, et cetera. That forces a tiling of space with black and white snakes that's quite non-trivial. And it's astounding that it works. <laughs> I, I've said it very generally. Hopefully one of you will get intrigued by that and explore it. The, the next uh, the next state uh, snake out does a compound helix. This I think it's a double or triple order, uh, you know, helix on a helix on a helix. Hmm. And it all works. Very strange. That's beautiful. I so see a parallel in that to humans thinking. If you have two opposing ideas, but you're somehow trying to get them to intertwine with each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beautiful. That so they keep on building on each other's arguments. <laughs> These they don't tear each other apart. Okay. They do actually fit space. Yeah, oh, lovely. To, to use Ted Nelson's coinage, they intertwingle. <laughs> yes, perfect <laughs> use of that word. <laughs> I'm I'm very sorry. I have to go uh, now, but it's been really wonderful seeing it. I don't want to wish to stop anything so thank you very much for everything and i'll talk to y'all later see you see you all very soon thank you bye bye thanks very much